If you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Leviticus chapter 23. We are coming down to the wire on our series on the feasts. And today I want to kind of get us started in the Feast of Tabernacles or, or Sukkot. So open up to Leviticus chapter 23. And we're actually going to read two seconds, two sections of scripture here because there's a, a parenthetical statement right in the middle. So we're going to pick up in verse 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths, to the Lord. Does anybody have something different besides Feast of Booths? Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. Okay. Um, some people might even, in, in one translation, I think it's uh, translated tents. Okay. Uh, verse 35. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. Okay, now we come to this parenthetical statement that's kind of inserted right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. It says, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offering, uh, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. Now we pick back up in verse 39, dealing specifically with uh, Sukkot. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the, the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. And on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. Now, I just want to kind of back up and, and summarize what's brought us to this point. Um, we've come into this study with the understanding that when God set these, these times, these feasts, uh, he did it with a prophetic purpose. Painting an illustration of the Messianic Advents. We looked at the spring feasts. We saw how Jesus in his first advent fulfilled every one of the feasts. The feast of Pesach, our Passover. He was our Paschal Lamb. He was the one that went to the cross on our behalf. Then we had the feast of unleavened bread. He was the perfect, sinless sacrifice. No leaven, no sin was found in him. We have the feast of first fruits. Paul says that Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. He is the first one to rise to never die again. We have stories of resurrection throughout the Old and the New Testament where people were raised from the dead, but all of those people died again. Jesus did not. He is the first fruits. And then we have Shavuot. Uh, or Pentecost, which is 50 days after. And we see that the Holy Spirit was sent and received on that day, and the church was birthed. Okay? And then we have the summer period. So we've, we've had the gathering in of the, the spring harvest, the oats and the grains. And then we have this period of several months where there's no feasts. And, and again, just to reiterate, when, when you read the word feast here, it's not feast in the Western thinking. It's not like Thanksgiving. Some of them are, but some of them, it, 
You know, we looked at uh, uh, Yom Kippur, and one of the things that the Jews did was they, they fasted for that entire feast. So the, the, the literal translation would be appointed times. These are the appointed times, okay? So we have this period where none of the feasts are going on, none of these appointed times are going, and then we come into the fall. Now, it's my belief that that summer period is the church age, and, and that's what we are in right now. And we talked a little bit last week about how I believe that the feasts were laid out in a, a, a chiastic order. They started and they moved down and, and then we have this period right in the middle where nothing's going on and then we have the Feast of Trumpets and, and we start moving back out, okay? Uh, we talked about the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, I believe that the, the, very clearly the scripture indicates that when Jesus comes again, it will be preceded by a loud trumpet blast, okay? Most people think it's the shofar. I don't. If, if the shofar sounds, I'm okay with that. I'm still willing to go. You know, I'm not going to be like, uh-uh. No, you know, that's the wrong trumpet. Uh, but I believe that uh, when, when Moses was given the instructions for the ark, he was told to make two horns uh, that were beaten, and these horns were sounded to gather all the people together. Okay, and so when, uh, I think when the, the trumpet is sounded, I think it's going to be that trumpet, that, that one that, of the beaten metal that, that is going to call everybody, all the Christians, up to, to Christ. Okay, and then we, we saw that uh, uh, prior in Tishri, the month of Tishri, the seventh month, we start with the Feast of Trumpets, and then we have a ten-day period where the Jews would, would prepare themselves and they would make sacrifice for their sins and they would make sure that they were right before God because the high holy day being Yom Kippur was coming on the 10th. And so they would establish, uh, make sure everything was right because if they were not right when they went to Yom Kippur, <clears throat> that the Jews believed that their name would be written in one of three books. And there's the, the high book, those that are righteous and holy and live so, and then there's the low book, the, 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 the book of damnation, where uh, those are the ones that were just reveled in their sin and are beyond redemption. And, and then there's the, the rest in the middle that are just, you, you've done neither one nor the other. And, and so there was this 10 days of preparation for Yom Kippur. We really spent quite a bit of time looking at the process that God laid out for the atonement. The high priest, <coughs> excuse me, had to make atonement for himself and his family first, and then he would make atonement for the nation of Israel. Okay? Um, it is my belief that um, in, in the, the chiasm, we, we ended the spring feasts with the birth of the church. And, and if you read through the book of Acts, second chapter of Acts, uh, it was almost all Jews in the upper room. And then within a very short time, the gospel was then delivered to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles actually became the predominant number of people in the church. Okay? Uh, remember the passage of Scripture that, that the last will be first and the first will be last. Paul says that salvation came to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And I believe that the church age, that's the Gentile age, that's the dispensation of grace for us. The Jews have been cut off for a time that we might be grafted in. Okay, <clears throat> well, when the trumpet blows, the church is taken out. Okay, so see, we end the spring feast with the birth of the church. We start the fall feast with the removal of the church. And I believe with it, the removal of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so then we come into Yom Kippur, and the, the really key thing for Yom Kippur for me is that every passage that talks about it, both in Exodus and Leviticus, it talks about the... Jews afflicting themselves, okay? And we wrapped up with the understanding that at the end times, when, when the last battle is fought, um, the Jews are going to be afflicted physically and spiritually. They're going to be afflicted physically and that the entire world is going to come up against them, okay? And that's going to lead them to the place where their, their soul, their mind, is going to realize that they've fallen out of the will of God and they need Him. Right now, uh, Israel is, is one of the largest um, 
non-theistic countries in the world per capita. Very humanist. They have very few believing Jews in Israel. Okay? Uh, that's going to change. It's got to change. And, and the believing Jews that are in Israel only believe half of it. Okay? And we're going to see a little bit about why as we go through this study. So, they're going to come on hardship. That hardship is going to open their eyes to their, their loss of the Messiah, their need for the Messiah, their need for God to intervene, and God will respond. And then we end up all of the feasts with the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? So we're going to get into the Feast of Tabernacles today. I'm going to go through some of the names, and I'm going to hit some of the scriptures. Now, for the sake of brevity, uh, I'm not going to read all of the passages of scripture. The references will be up. I would encourage you, make notes, go look at it. You know, I, I, I will keep saying and keep saying, the New Testament is the walls. The Old Testament is the foundation. And if you don't understand the foundation, you can't really appreciate the walls. All right? Um, nothing in here is in here on accident. Everything is with a purpose. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to open our eyes to the purpose that this is written for, what's going on here. Okay? So, the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's, uh, we'll discuss the names. The first one is Hag Hasukah. I'm, I'm not even going to try and get the, the, the pronunciations right. Um, I was able to find pronunciations for some of them, but most of them I was not. Um, Hag Hasukot is the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. We just read that in Leviticus 23, verse 34. The second one is Hag Adonai, the Feast of Jehovah or the Feast of the Lord. We also just read that one in 2339. Uh, the third name is Hag Ha'asif, the Feast of Ingathering. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when... Um, I was in the church, the, the particular church that I belonged to, um, every year had the Feast of Ingathering. And what that was, was one time a year for people to catch up all their tithes and their offerings. Uh, the school that I went actually had a big celebration for the Feast of Ingathering where they would bring all the alumni back and the alumni would, would make donations to help pay for the next year of the schooling. Um, but I never once never once heard that the Feast of Ingathering was in light of Shavuot, or Sukkot, excuse me, okay? And so, uh, the Feast of Ingathering is in Exodus 23, 16. Let's go to the next one. Ah, the Feast. The majority of the time when a Jew references the Feast, they are referring to to the Feast of Tabernacles. Even in Scripture, there are several times where they just say the Feast, um, 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, verse 2. That's the passage where Solomon is uh, dedicating the temple. And it talks about um, on the 15th of the, of the seventh month, they were celebrating the Feast. Okay, well, we know uh, from the passage we just read that the 15th day of the seventh month is when the Feast of Tabernacles starts. So when, when they say the Feast, almost always they are referring to the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? Um, number five, Zman Sim uh, the season of our rejoicing. This is a rabbinic name. Uh, actually, several of these you will not find scripture reference for. They're coming out of the Talmud or the Mishnah, uh, the writings of the Jews and the rabbis. Um, Yom Hashmi Shel Arava, the seventh day of the willow. Okay, now as we dig into this, we're going to see that the Jews have a number of customs, a number of traditions that they set up to establish, to worship properly, <coughs> to celebrate properly. Um, you know, we've, we've discussed before, um, the Jews are not unlike us. <clears throat> and that God gives them a directive and says, you can come up to this point, but you can't cross it. Now, some of us go, oh, really? And then we suffer for our foolishness. But others will go, well, if that's a dangerous place, I better make the boundary here so I don't approach the danger place. 
And then after a period of time, as generations go by, well, you know, if, if that is the threshold there, and that's preventing us from get, getting to the dangerous place, then maybe we should really, in order to be safe, we should be here. Now, the Jews are notorious for doing this. Uh, as we go through the study, um, the Jews have 300 and some odd laws, regulations concerning the proper celebration of the feast, just to give you some, some insight as to what their rules require. Uh, in order to have a proper tabernacle, they actually came up with measurements. The, the smallest a tabernacle can be would be for one person and a table. And that, they determined somehow, is 26 inches wide by 26 inches deep. That's the smallest you can have your tabernacle. And it can't be too low, so it, it can't be below something like 32 or 36 inches. But neither can it be too high, so you can't go above 30 feet. So anywhere in that area, you're good. Okay. So they wrote 300-some laws concerning how this was to be celebrated properly. All right, so <clears throat> the seventh day of the willow, on the seventh day, there were a couple things that they do by tradition and with, with some purpose drawn from Scripture, but on the seventh day, uh, it's called the day of the willow. It's also called Hoshana Rabbah, save us in the highest. Uh, this also refers to the seventh day. Now, Hoshana Rabbah, does anybody, does that sound familiar to anybody? Rosh Hashanah. Okay, there's also... Um, the triumphal entry. Okay, when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on the donkey, what were the people saying? They were saying Hosanna Rabbah, okay, or Hosanna Rabbah. Save us, glory in the highest. Save us, okay. They're using that phrase. Now it's not on accident, and we're going to get into this a little bit as we get into the study. When Jesus came in, what's the, what's the other thing that they did? They called out Hoshana Rabbah, but what did they do physically? Palm branches. They cut palm branches. We call it Palm Sunday. Okay? Palm branches have nothing to do with the, the Feast of Passover. So why are they cutting palm branches and waving palm branches and putting palm branches down in front of them? We're going to get into that. It's not without purpose that it was put in there. So uh, let's go to the number eight. Shmini Atzeret, the eighth day of the assembly. Now, if you'll notice as we read through this, um, it started off and it says, on the 15th day of the seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths. So how many days is the Feast of Booths? Seven. seven. But then we get a little bit further down, and it says, uh, on the eighth day, you shall hold a holy convocation. The Jews call it the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, but the first seven are different than the last one. Okay? And we're we're going to get in, we're going to see a little bit of those differences, but because the eighth day is commanded, they actually call it Shmini Atzeret, the eighth day. It's part of the feast, but it's not. You know, it's kind of like that, that in-law that you're obligated to claim, but you really don't want to. Yeah, that, this is my... My wife's family. <laughs> or, in her case, my husband's family. And if you knew my family, you would understand why she would be hesitant to say that. Um, so, these are the names. Oh yeah, number nine, Simchat Torah, Rejoicing of the Law. Now this is an interesting thing. Uh, the eighth day, the Jews plan the reading of the law and they break it down in 52 weeks, okay? And the day that that starts is the eighth day, but it's also the day it ends, okay? They break out the reading of the law in 52 segments, so they read a portion of the law each week, and when they get to the eighth day, they finish Deuteronomy, and then they immediately turn around <coughs> and start again with Genesis 20, because that's where the, the law starts, all right? So, to them, this is the, the rejoicing of the law. They've, they've gone from strength to strength. They've finished up the one, and they're starting all over again. Okay? <clears throat> now, in order for us to understand this, we have to look at um, the passages of Scripture that God gave to Israel 
and there's actually quite a few of them. Uh, we've just read Leviticus 23, both passages in there, but I want to draw out a couple of things from, from what we just read. Um, Leviticus 23, first, the date that this is to be celebrated is the 15th of Tishri, the seventh month. Now, it's interesting. We talked about this before on some of the feasts. This was great to have a specific day when everybody was in Israel, okay? Because it was the same day, whether you were in the northern part or the southern part, the eastern part or the western part, it was all the same day. But when the diaspora came and they were dispersed, they weren't really sure when the day should be, when it would be counted as the official start of the day. Because remember, in order for a day to be, to be beginning, uh, it has to be in the evening. So they go from evening to evening, not morning to morning. Okay? And for the day to start, there has to be three stars visible on the horizon. That's the official start of the next day. Okay? So you're going to see three stars on the horizon a whole lot quicker in Iran than you will in France. Okay? So the way the Jews accommodated this is they actually started it on two days. And, and so the, the feast actually kind of edges up into nine days. Now, they, they, if you're in Israel, it's still the seven because that's where God gave them the law. That's where everything started. So they still have the original starting day on the 15th of Tishri. But if you're in other places and you're not quite sure, it's perfectly acceptable to start it a day early. It is not acceptable to start it a day late. Okay? So there's this extra day that's boom, stuck in there just to make sure everything. Remember that, that law? We don't want to cross the line. We'll, put, we'll add an extra day so we don't get really close to the line. Okay, so, <clears throat> first thing, the date has been established. Second, uh, the time frame has been established. It is to be celebrated for seven days, and then an added eighth day uh, is, is appended to the end of it. The first day is a holy convocation, a sacred assembly, okay? Um, the first day and the eighth day. Now, we don't really understand the, 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 um, all that's involved in this because we've never really celebrated the Sabbath in the way that it was laid out for Israel. Um, we're, we're very westernized. Don't, don't get upset because Paul makes it very clear that we have freedom, that we should celebrate every day as if it's the Sabbath. Okay? So, so don't get uptight about it, but we really don't have a, a very good fundamental understanding. When they're talking about a Sabbath's rest, or a, a, a sacred assembly, or a holy convocation, a Sabbath rest. No regular or ordinary work is to be done. Okay? So, if you know tomorrow's going to be a Sabbath rest, you got to make sure there's fodder for your animals to get them through tomorrow, because you're not supposed to be going out to feed them. you, you got to make sure there's water available. All the stuff that you need for your meals has got to be taken care of, because guess what? You're not supposed to cook. Okay? So, all of this has to be taken care of. So the first day is set as a holy convocation, a sacred assembly. And, and we'll see a little bit in, in a couple of the other passages. Um, this feast is one of the three pilgrimage feasts. Um, God says in, in Exodus, I believe it's chapter 23, uh, we'll, we'll probably touch on that, um, might get to it today, uh, that there are three feasts that all of the males in Israel are to present themselves at the place that God has chosen. Now, when Israel was first settled, the tabernacle was at Shiloh. And then later, uh, David brought it into the city of David, and then Solomon moved it up into the temple. And so the temple is the place where God has, has declared his residence. Is, that's where he will be. That's his place. So when the, temp, uh, the temple was made, all the males three times a year have to come in. Does anybody remember what those three feasts are? So, Sorry? Passover. Yeah, the start of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Pentecost. Pentecost. Pentecost is the second. And the trumpets. Feast of trumpets. Feast of Tabernacles, this one. So they had to come three times a year. Now, um, I really want to encourage you to read these passages of Scripture, especially when we get to the New Testament Scriptures. 
um, I had a revelation. I, I love studying because I love learning new things. But I had a revelation, this uh, studying this, that, that just kind of went, whoa, this makes so much more sense. When we get into the New Testament, you're actually going to read John chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10. Okay? Read them all the way through. Because the very start is going to tell you the setting. It's going to tell you that it's about the time for the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay? And as we go through the customs and the traditions of what the Jews did to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, you're going to be able to overlay that right on top of what Jesus was doing in Jerusalem in John 7, 8, 9, and 10. And the things he says, all of a sudden, a little light bulb is going to go on. Ding! Whoa! Okay, that makes sense. Hopefully, you'll get a light bulb that will go deep. You know? Mine kind of goes... <laughs> Boink. You know, but you know, hopefully you'll get some light shed on this. Okay, so a uh, couple other things: sacrifices. Sacrifices are to be made each day, and then finally, the eighth day is added on as a holy convocation. Uh, so then, the next passages, uh, just going down a few verses, 39 through 43. There's a couple things I want to draw out. One, you notice that it says uh, in 39. Um, when you have gathered in the produce of the land. Okay? Now, remember the, the spring feasts, they were supposed to take the first of the produce and bring it to the, to the temple. Okay? In the fall feasts, you've already gathered everything. Everything has been brought in. The, the summer harvest is complete. Okay? So, this is the setting that it is. All right? The, the harvest has been brought in. Um, it, it is to last for seven days, again, with the eighth day added on. Uh, the Sabbath rest, the first and the eighth days. You're going, why are you repeating this? Because the Bible does. You know, when a teacher repeats something, why do they do that? Because it's important. You need to make a note of this. And God doesn't repeat this just once or twice. He repeats this multiple times, okay? Because remember, he's setting this, this up as a shadow of the things to come. These are prophetic statements, and they're going to be fulfilled in a literal fashion in the second coming, okay? So, um, Sabbath rests on the first and the eighth day. Uh, they were to gather fruit from, let's, let's read that verse, because there's, Several things going on here. Um, verse 40, And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees. Does anybody have something different in their translation? Beautiful trees. Beautiful trees. Boughs, boughs of goodly trees. Goodly trees. Luxuriant trees. Luxuriant trees. Kind of get the picture there? Okay. Um, and then branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees. Does anybody have something different for boughs of leafy trees? Thick trees. Big trees? Thick. Thick trees, gotcha. Okay. And willow of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Okay. Um, this is what the Jews understood this to mean. We're gonna touch on this a little bit more when we go into the customs of how they celebrated this. But down at the bottom, you guys see that? You know what that is? I'm trying to remember the name of it. It looks like a lemon. It's not a lemon. The lulab? No, the lulab is the, the whole thing. But the, the fruit down there, it's a, I think it's called an urchot. It's a citron. Okay? It's, it's similar to a lemon. Now, we talked about the laws. They have laws concerning this as well. One, it could not be smaller than an egg, but there was no top end, okay? It had to be fresh. Um, it had to have no spots on it. It had to have no blemishes on it. That's the fruit from the splendid tree. What they understood it to be was, was that, okay? Some Jews even believe that this was the fruit that Adam and Eve ate in the garden, to which I would go, keep it away from me. It did not turn out well the first time, okay? So, but then they have these three branches. Um, how did you pronounce that, Jeannie? Lulav? Lulav. Lulav. 
you'll notice that there's three different types of branches. There's a palm branch. There is what they called uh, in, in the passage here, um, it said boughs of leafy trees. The Jews think that meant myrtle. And so there's myrtle branches, palm branches, and then there's also the willow branches. Now, these branches were to be bound together. There's all kinds of rules as to what's allowed and what's not allowed in the branches that you select. Okay? They have to be a certain length. They can't be wilted. They can't be broken. They can't be bruised. Um, they have to retain, be able to retain their shape for the, the seven days, the, technically the eighth day. Um, and, and then they were to be bound together. Now, the lulav technically is, is, I believe, the palm branch. That's a word for the palm branch. But when they bind them all together, they call the whole thing the lulav. Okay? And as they go through this ceremony and, and what they do, um, they, each of these represent something. Okay? And we'll get into that as we go forward, what they represent. But each of these things has a symbol to the Jewish people. All right? So this is what they're talking about. Down here in verse 40, um, the fruit of the splendid trees, the urchop or the, the citron, uh, branches of the palm trees, boughs of the leafy trees, and willow of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord. Now that's an interesting comment there. Did your parents ever tell you to be happy? I had a friend when we were in youth group, um, he was pretty shy, um, he didn't like to really he didn't like to go out of his house. He was very content to be at home. And his mom and dad felt like he really needed some friends. And, and uh, one day they told him, you know, you're going to go to youth group. Well, Dean didn't want to go to youth group. And finally his dad got upset with him and he said, you know what? You get your butt in the car, you're going to youth group, and you will have fun. <laughs> Poor Dean. Um, that always stuck out to me because how can you tell someone to have fun? Um, you know, some people, when you tell them to do something, they want to do the opposite. So when somebody says, have fun, that automatically ruins it for them. But, but God is telling the people here that you are to rejoice. This season is to be a season of rejoicing. Now, compare that to what we just read about Yom Kippur. Because in Yom Kippur, that was to be a season of what? Affliction. It was to be a season where, where first they, they had to come confront their sin and they had to make their sin right before God and man. And then they had to um, go through this understanding in, the, in this feast that, that there was an affliction that they were required to do. Okay? So this is in direct contrast. Um, <clears throat> so they were to rejoice. Um, <clears throat> They are to dwell in booths or tents for seven days. Now, again, what does it mean? Uh, there are a number of rules that are set up as to how the tent is to be constructed. The walls don't really matter, except that there has to be at least two. Okay? You can make them out of any material. doesn't matter. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the Middle Ages, um, there were Jews that lived in Europe that they were on like the top floor of, of an apartment or a house and there was no room for them to physically set up a tent so they actually had roofs that would unhook and flip up and become walls and then they would drape over the top of it the branches one of the laws one of the rules uh, for your booth is that it has to be covered with lamp with branches nothing else it's got to be branches now you can choose the different types of branches we see in some places it was palm and other places it was willow doesn't matter. But you can't weave it so tight that you can't see through it because you have to be able to see the stars. Neither can it be open too wide such that rain would come in and ruin the inside of the tabernacle. Now I don't know what measurement they fixed on to, to make it just wide enough, but, but that's, that's the rules, okay? Um, I told you about the measurement. Can't be any narrower than 26 inches. Can't be any shorter than, I think it's 32 inches. Can't be any taller than 30 feet, okay? So, specific rules for the, uh, the building of the booths. Uh, one other, or two other points. One, all Israel was to participate.
Verse 43, uh, I'm sorry, verse 42, you should dwell in the booth for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. Um, it's interesting because as we get into some of the other passages, you'll notice here it doesn't talk about the sojourner. Several of the other feasts deal specifically with the sojourner, uh, foreigners that were living in the land of Israel. This passage doesn't talk about it. As a matter of fact, in the other passages referring to this feast, the, they, the sojourners are not required to build a booth, but they are required to celebrate. As a matter of fact, when you've established your, your booth, you are supposed to, as part of the celebration, you're supposed to invite people in to celebrate with you. Okay? And so the sojourner is supposed to have a season of rejoicing with you, and it's, it's partly your responsibility to make sure that they do. Okay? So all of Israel participates, and it is to serve as a reminder of how God brought Israel out of Egypt. Um, one more passage, and we'll, we'll stop there for today. Flip over to Exodus chapter 23. And if you've been paying attention as we've gone through these feasts, you'll see that uh, Exodus 23 um, <clears throat> kind of parallels um, Levitic, or, uh, yeah, Leviticus 23. So Exodus 23, we're going to pick up in verse 14. <clears throat> verse 14, we start off with the uh, three feasts. Three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. Well, we know there's more than three, so he's speaking specifically about specific feasts. Uh, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. As I commanded you, you shall not eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib, which is the first month, for in it you came out of Egypt. No one shall appear before me empty-handed. Okay? Keep that thought in mind as we go through the sacrifices and we go through the other requirements of, of what's going on in this feast. Verse 16, you shall keep the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times you shall appear in the year, uh, three times in the year you shall, oh, let me try this again. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord your God. Okay? We see now the, this, this trilogy of, of feasts that all the males are required to go up to Jerusalem. Now what's interesting is that it says the males were supposed to go up, but we know from other accounts in the Bible that they didn't go up just by themselves, did they? Uh, because remember when Jesus was 12, they went up to Jerusalem. If it was just the males, it would have been Joseph and, and Jesus. It would not have been Joseph and Mary and Jesus and all the other relatives. I mean, there were enough other relatives that it took Mary and Joseph a couple days to figure out that Jesus wasn't with them. We had that happen once in our family. Um, when, you know, when we were living in Houston, my whole family was down there, and, and we got six different cars and nobody ever rode in their parents' cars, because why would you do that when you could ride with your uncle or your aunt or your grandparents? And so we were at my brother's house, and we were getting ready to go to dinner, and we got in the car, and we are kind of looking around, and Chris and I going, where's Benjamin? So my brother lives in a cul-de-sac, so we made the circle all the way around the cul-de-sac. Benjamin with you? Nope. You guys got Benjamin? Uh-huh. You guys have Benjamin in your car? Nope. All the other family was accounted for, accounted for, but not Benjamin. So we made the circle back, pulled back up in the driveway, went into the house, and Benjamin's still sitting in the back room playing a video game. <laughs> now, the strange thing about this was everybody else in the room heard that we were leaving. <laughs> Benjamin's wiping out everybody. <laughs> he's, he's killing it. Benj, <coughs> we're going to get dinner. You want to join us? Oh, yeah, okay. And, and he came, but they went days without knowing that Jesus was with them. So the, the idea here being that it wasn't just the males that went up, the families went up together, okay? So a couple things I want to draw out real quick. Um, <clears throat> it is one of the Shalash Regalim, which is the three feasts. That's the Jewish name for the three feasts. And it is called here the Feast of Ingathering. And you'll note again, it... God differentiates between the first fruits and the ingathering, which is the last fruits. 
Okay? You, the beginning and the end. You celebrate because God has given it all to you. 